Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. My name is Marcus Grodi, your host for this program, and this is our open line episode in which I invite back former guests. Uh, in this case, they're, they've been on uh, at least once or twice before, and they're familiar faces and voices here on EWTN. Jim and Joy Pinto, both former Episcopalians. They're hosts of At Home with jo Jim and Joy on EWTN Global Catholic Radio. So you may have heard them, you may not have seen them. They've also uh, done some spots uh, that have uh, aired on EWTN television about marriage. That's right. Maybe we can talk about that in a moment. But I want to remind you that you are an important part of the program. So if you have a question for Jim or Joy, call us 1-800-221-9460. Outside North America, 205-271. 2980, or you can send an email to journeyhome at EWTN.com. And your questions are particularly important for this open line program. We want to know what you're thinking about what you've heard from Jim and Joy. And uh, this is old home week. I mean, you've both been on this program a bunch of times, but I particularly wanted to have you back, invite you back for this evening because we just had the March for Life. Yeah. And that's why I want you back now, because I know that both of you, so much of your life is dedicated to life issues, mm -hmm. marriage, pro-life issues, uh, you know, dealing with, with, with crises. Uh, but before we uh, jump into the issues, I always invite the uh, returning guests to give us a little snippet of, yeah. your, of, of your journeys. Well, it's so nice to be with my beloved and that way we're together and with you as well. <laughs> But uh, I grew up in Hudson County, New Jersey, a town called North Bergen. Joy grew up in Guttenberg, New Jersey, just a few miles away. I grew up in a Catholic family, the youngest of four. And uh, it was a good experience growing up in between the George Washington Bridge and Lincoln Tunnel, uh, looking at that New York skyline so, so densely populated. Uh, although I had a little park right down the block and could play basketball and shoot hoops and athletics, and it was really wonderful. Um, growing up in, in the church uh, at the time I did, born in the 50s, growing up in the 60s, um, lots of good things. You could really sense the presence of God you know, in the church, especially at the time of Holy Eucharist. But for me, in some ways, uh, the church was like uh, a museum without a doset, you know, explaining it. Uh, it was sort of like watching TV uh, without sound. And uh, so many beautiful things. I was having experiences there. Uh, made my first communion and went on towards, you know, confirmation. Uh, I can remember being confirmed. Uh, and, and after my confirmation, some of the, the big kids in town uh, saying to me, hey, Jimmy boy, you became a man. You became a man. You know, you were confirmed. And I wasn't quite sure what that meant. But I really do think there's something about confirmation and becoming a man that I wish I knew then. Um, so I know that part of it was my own lack of ability to hear, my own rebelliousness. But really in the 60s, it was really a time of, uh, it, it seemed a confusing time. Even though the church was clear about her, her morals and doctrine, yet a lot of conversation going on regarding authority and so on. And uh, I didn't, didn't hear, and I really do think confirmation, if I understood what it meant to be a Catholic man, a Christian man, sanctified to the Lord, uh, like uh, the Jewish young boys making their bar mitzvah, owning the Torah, owning the law, owning the eternal word, Jesus Christ, uh, in the flesh. I would have, would have gone a long way. So I kind of drifted away from the church because I didn't quite get it, and especially when uh, there was the, the uh, conversations about sexuality, umane vitae, and uh, the teaching on the church on the transmission of human life, uh, the gift of giving oneself in totality, unitively, procreatively, and so on, I can remember the sense of the congregation, some people in my own family, uh, you know, kind of saying, well, you know, we could be good Catholics and we don't really have to obey this. <laughs> um, and so many laity felt that way and maybe even some, some clergy uh, felt that way. And it was really a confusing time, you know, for me. And I uh, began to drift away from the church in terms of, uh, you know, does this place really have authority? I mean, is the church really authoritative? You know, can we really pick and choose? And uh, just eventually began to drift away. Um, I met Joy uh, when she was 14 years old, and uh, I was 17, and so that's about uh, 30, 39 years ago. It's a long time. That we met, 
And uh, so we, uh, when I saw, it, when I saw <laughs> Joy, uh, I mean, uh, I know love at first sight really needs to be tested. Uh, you know, if somebody tells you that, but I saw Joy walking through the hallways at our high school twice, and I was totally speechless and, and just in awe, and it's only gotten worse since then, and that's 33 years of marriage. <laughs> but uh, we began to, to date, and it's just a, a lovely, you know, relationship. But uh, I must confess that we weren't uh, chaste as we should be. And uh, it wasn't until five years of our dating uh, that I really began to, after my mother's death, my mom died early in my life, and then my father passed away, and started thinking, you know, rethinking the faith. I said, you know, what is this all about? And began to study the scriptures. Uh, Jehovah Witnesses presented me with a Bible. Uh, I was especially intrigued with John chapter 1, the eternal word was made flesh. Uh, and, and came into a conversion experience in Montgomery, Alabama. We were both reared in New Jersey, as I said, uh, but radically converted me. And one of the first things that changed in my life was, was uh, uh, this call to holiness, sexuality, mm. what's true chastity. And our lives were totally, uh, radically yeah. changed. And uh, so I experienced a dramatic conversion in Montgomery, Alabama, accompanying Joy uh, in a wedding that she was a part of. And then Joy could tell her own story, but she gradually just fell in love with Jesus. And uh, knowing Christ really made a tremendous difference in our life regarding our sexuality, the way we re related to one another, reverence for one another, the sanctity of life. Um, and in the midst of that, uh, you know, as time went on, uh, we, we were married after six years of, of, I'd say five years of dating and one year of courting, reclaiming a new uh, a purity, a new virginity you know, in our lives, and, uh, and really felt called to seminary. Went off to Trinity Episcopal School for the Ministry, a wonderful evangelical Anglican seminary uh, in uh, the Pittsburgh area. I went there for three years in terms of training uh, for the priesthood. Uh, at the end of that time, was invited back down to Alabama, which is the place of my conversion, and uh, had a parish here where I worked as a layman, a deacon, a priest. 22 years I served as an Episcopal priest in Fairfield. We still live there over 30 years now. Um, wonderful congregation, wonderful people. Uh, and so that's, that's you know, th and then, then began to study church history and uh, began to look at this whole area again of sexuality, living in an African-American community in particular. 80% uh, or so uh, did not have a father I in the family. Our congregation was growing, African-American. So my Sanctity of Life ministry first revolved around the equality of all people, of the races, and the need to restore uh, the Sanctity of Life, marriage, and the family. Mm -hmm. In the process of that, began to look back on the Catholic Church, study the Catechism of the Catholic Church, Love and Responsibility by John Paul II, uh, theology of the body, umare vitae, evangelium vitae, and began to say, oh my gosh. See, I didn't really know what I left. So I'm a revert. I've come back to the church <laughs> after I began to hear again. It's kind of like Helen Keller uh, with Ann Sullivan, who finally helped her to hear. And once I heard, I returned back home. All right. And you were lockstep all the way, right? Hey, yeah, sure. No, we, um, <laughs> when Jim and I converted. Um, when I first became a Christian, I fell madly in love with Jesus. And um, I just started to read the scripture. And I think the best thing that describes our spirituality is our obedience and love for God. Mm -hmm. If God said it, by His grace, we try to obey it, which like, okay, well, God said it. And our response, um, because He's so extravagant in His mercy to us, is to love Him back in obedience. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and in joy and in celebration because what God says is true and so uh, and it's right and so we want to obey that and be pleasing children in His sight. Mm. So that describes really um, in a paintbrush who we are right. and um, when we got married and we moved off to seminary and you know we thought that, I thought that was it, that was going to be, my husband was going to be an Episcopal priest and we were going to live happily ever after and that was okay. And then Jim began his journey um, of authority because in the Episcopal church the authority was fluid yeah. and the line in the sand kept changing. And so every time there was a new conference there were new rules. And um, I think the dividing line really one day was when I was home with our youngest son, Wesley, and he, we were laying on the floor watching TV and 2020 was doing a story on Episcopal priest in New Jersey who was living in the rectory with his lover. And Wesley, who was about four or five, turned around and said to Jim, Daddy, is that man an Episcopal priest like you're an Episcopal priest? Right. 
And then we were like, whoa, wait a minute. You know, what are we doing? For the sake of our children, this, this isn't right. So when Jim started his journey back to the Catholic Church, I was very happy as an Episcopal priest's wife, and I loved our congregation, and I really wasn't excited about going where he was going. Mm -hmm. and, um, but I loved Jim, and I loved Jesus, and I knew this was going to hurt. And so I just held on, you know, because I, we wanted to obey. And so Jim had said to me, "Hun, I will wait for you as long as this takes, which was very comforting. Um, you know, Jim's an academic. He has to understand it, you know, dissect it. The side of his bed had a bazillion books, you know. <laughs> the side of my bed had Patrick Madrid's book, The Little Vignette <coughs> Surprised by Truth, which was about all I could handle, you know, because I knew where I was going was going to be really painful. And so I could read like a little story about somebody's life who got converted. And I said, oh, isn't that nice? You know, and put the thing back down and didn't know that would be my journey. But we did, we, and we obeyed God, and for the sake of authority and for the sake of truth, we really believed that we were to come into the Catholic Church. Right. And so we did, and we brought three of our children, of our grown children, and our oldest son, Matt, he's not in the Catholic Church, but they all went to Catholic school, so it wasn't mm -hmm. like, this was like so, so foreign to them. Mm -hmm. all right. We do have four beautiful children, nine grandchildren, some of them are tuning in tonight, so we wanted to give a shout out to all of them. <laughs> of course. Um, and we're, we are getting phone calls and emails. It's great. Okay. Please, uh, all of you, please uh, put your questions here for, for Joy and, and Jim. In, in the work that I do as in the Coming Home Network, uh, we're, we help Protestant ministers who have been guided by the Holy Spirit and open their, and they're mm -hmm. looking at the church. Mm -hmm. And then they get to this barrier, they all yeah. know, what am I going to do now? Right. And often, a question that I've heard, that was on my own mind when I was on the journey as a Presbyterian minister in a church, you were an Anglican coming into the church, that sometimes the question is, and maybe it's the devil tempting us, uh, you know, had you misheard God all those yeah. years? If you're going to become Catholic, then you thought you were going to seminary, you thought God was calling you. Uh, it was you were mishearing them then? How come you? How do you know you're not mishearing them now? And my commitment mm -hmm. has always been that no, God has been training people all along yeah. Yeah. when they were non-Catholics, even yeah. giving them certain gifts for their use when they come home to the church, and that is certainly yeah. true of you too. Yeah. Uh, talk about that because when you look back, even your ministry in the the, the black community. How has that prepared you for your work now that you're Catholic? Well, it, it was scary because the, the foundation shaking, you know, and you're like, oh my gosh, did I just miss my whole life? Like, yeah. did I just like live this whole life and it was like I got punked or something, you know? <laughs> it was, you know, because you, you, it's like, oh my gosh. And, um, you know, because what we did, we did a full blown out love in the Lord. And so did we miss it? You know, and yeah. so you have to, you do, you have to step back and say, no, God was in the midst of it all, yeah. yes. you know, and, yeah. and hold on to that. Yeah, yeah. you know, God is so gracious and so merciful and so kind, so committed to his children. I think the other thing for me is really understanding that all of us who are alive at this time, that it's almost like we've been part of a divorced family in the church, okay? We weren't there at the time of the Reformation. We didn't make the decisions. They were made for us. So all of us are growing up in, in various traditions. We're trying to be obedient to what we know. And so I, I think it's a little different situation than when the church was truly one. We're all born into this situation of trying to find our way. And there's all sorts, sorts of teaching, Sola Scriptura and Evangelical and Pentecostal and Catholic. And it's all really, you know, God's far more patient with us than we are with ourselves. And so, yeah, I think God will will take everything and work it to his ends and to his glory. So we do bear responsibility, but in another sense, we really don't. Yeah. We've inherited a very difficult situation yeah. to find but our way. And I think once, I think it was Bender Cashel when I was staying at his retreat center one yeah. time, dealing with some of these questions, and I think it was he that said, now you guys remember that some of the suffering that you are going through is to be offered up mm. for the divorce. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm for the division, mm -hmm. the suffering that's there. Mm -hmm. That's part of what we go through, right. is to offer that up. Right. But I, I did want to make sure you had a chance to mention, again, with the trajectory of your use of gifts, 
your training experience, right. what you're doing now. I mean, you right. never would have dreamed 20 years ago that you'd be doing a, a radio program on EWTN. But, no. <laughs> but all this stuff with the pro-life work that yeah. you're doing, talk a little bit about that with the audience. Well, you, you know, from the time of our adult conversion, uh, you know, we've really had a heart for evangelization. And I think so many people who are listening out there, they might be ministerial couples or evangelicals or Pentecostals, uh, might be in ministry and then you got to deal with, well, I may never be able to be a minister again or, you know, in the priesthood and so on. But the deal is, you know, every Christian is called to be uh, a missionary, uh, an evangelist of, uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. By virtue of our baptism, we've got a prophetic ministry, a priestly ministry, a kingly ministry, and that will never change. And so at this point in our lives, we're sharing about, you know, who we are. And the church says that, uh, you know, be who you are. And so we're sharing the fact that every human being is sacred, every human being is a reflection of the image and likeness of God, every marriage is a reflection of the Holy Trinity, um, and that our, that our family and the ministry that we did, we ministered as a, as a family to the community, to the church, to the world. And so that's what we're trying to do with our radio show at Home with Jim and Joy every Monday, two to three. You know, we say, hey, knock on our door, come on in, let's speak about marriage and the family, let's talk about how the church is used to transform the world and how every individual is called to be a missionary of the gospel of life. And that's the key work that I do with Father Frank Pavone in Priest for Life, uh, is, is to form people in the faith, especially pro-life. We give them a pro-life spirituality so that they can deepen that spirituality because everything we do comes out of that center of love for Christ. And we have developed a study guide, uh, a study guide to Umane Vitae, and so it has the document of Umani Vitae in there, has a study guide, very nice for individuals or for couples to do together, has a glossary for the difficult words. Joy and I went through Umani Vitae and said, well, what words don't we know? We gotta look up, we put those in there. There are a lot. It has reflections in there from yep, Father Frank reasons. Pavone, <laughs> Dr. Alveda King, good reflections, and it makes uh, the encyclicals of, of the church uh, you know, easier to, to kind of read and less intimidating. So it's just wonderful to, to yeah. be a Christian. It's wonderful to be a Catholic. Well, you had mentioned a little earlier, Joy, about the, the line in the sands that were being drawn in authority mm -hmm. on certain issues from the Anglican Episcopal Church every year were changing. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, talk a little bit about, see, I know from emails that we've got Baptists and Presbyterians and Lutherans, Episcopalians mm -hmm. watching. Uh, we had a few Episcopalians get mad at me a couple weeks ago when we did our Anglican roundtable. Uh, uh, they're watching. Yeah. I want you to talk about why having a, a, a church like the Catholic Church in terms of its trustworthy authority is so necessary when you're dealing with these issues, yeah. pro-life, yeah. in your own life when mm -hmm. you're dealing with suffering, because mm -hmm. I know mm -hmm. that's a part of your own journey. Mm -hmm. I mean, Bible alone right. or some tradition alone. Mm -hmm. Talk about the importance of this church that we have. Well, I, I'll, I'll speak quick about my suffering. Um, I was diagnosed with cancer about four and a half years ago, and, um, and being a part of the Catholic Church, um, one of the things, and also as an Episcopalian, was having the communion of saints. Right. And so, because um, when we die, we never die, <laughs> we live. And so, um, as in my suffering of being in the bed one day for 17 hours, and um, really probably a dark night of my own soul and I needed I needed prayer and I couldn't I could didn't even have enough energy to call a friend or to call my spouse and and so I called heaven down and so I started calling on the saints in heaven and said come and sit with me on my bed come and fill this room and pray with me that I would move through this dark night of my own soul. And so the company of heaven and that connection, um, especially being in the Catholic Church is so important because it's eternal. And I will see those saints and I will thank them one day face to face for, <laughs> for their prayer support and for their intercession. And I still pray to them through, through the suffering. And so, yeah. and, and the big thing for us was the authority, just, how safe, you know, one of the things Jim said to me on the journey was he said, "Hun, he said, who do you think is in charge of the church? You know, and as a Protestant, you don't think like that. You know, you don't think who's in charge of the church. You're in charge of the church. You know, you turn the lights on, you have the keys, you run the vacuum, <laughs> you buy everything, you're in charge of the church, you know? But you're not in charge of the church. And so I had to think about it and I thought, well, as my Protestant thinking, I thought maybe Billy Graham, 
And then I thought, well, what about the charismatics? Well, maybe Benny Hen, <laughs> you know, and just the absurdity of that. And then I, I said, you know, I don't know, but I can imagine that God would not have left this disarray. I mean, somebody is in charge, and I don't, and I'm, I'm not it, and you're not it, Jim. And boy, was that a freeing feeling, you know, to come home to say we're not in charge, and it's humbling because in Protestant land you are in charge. Because yeah. yeah. you believe that what you're saying is in line with Jesus, so right. it must be true. Amen. Right. Or and if not, you'll convince yourself that right. it is. <laughs> well, I think uh, you know John Paul II really coined the phrase correctly: the culture of death. And I think if you live long enough. If you're trying to pastor a congregation, you're married with family. Uh, this is this is uh, not just a phrase; it's reality, and there is real savagery going on in this world and in the church. Yeah. And we need a voice that speaks definitively and clearly and says what a man is, what a woman is, uh, sexuality, uh, clear on abortion, clear on on what's going on scientifically today. What is acceptable? What isn't acceptable? What's licit? What's not licit? Um, there really is a culture of death. The culture of life will prevail, but we have to sound a clear trumpet blast and, and call the people together that we would procreate, that we would multiply, that we would fill the world, that we would conquer with love, with God's agape love. So for me as a pastor, loving the sheep, I'm saying, gosh, you know, we're only having one or two children per family here. You know, wh what is exactly going on? Divorce after divorce is happening. What does the church teach about divorce? And then I tried to, you know, we did six months of premarital counseling, and then we started to get really committed to Umani Vitae and the teaching of the church, and we would say, hey, you know, if you're not ready to have children, you're not really ready to get married. Yeah. I mean, because people are getting married, not even thinking about children, thinking about how they're going to postpone having children. Do you understand that that's an mm -hmm. integral part of being married? And then they would say to me, well, where are you getting this from? You're not getting this from the Episcopal Church. You know, we don't have to obey this. Yeah. And then, then that was a challenge to me to say, hey, you know, I've got to get to the church that has taught this for 2,000 years because this bears life. This is fruitful. This is the gospel of life. Life, marriage, family. What does the church believe everywhere for all time? What will bring life to my congregation, life to my family, life to this nation, life to the world? And I found that in the voice of the Holy Catholic Church. You know, I, I don't know if I've ever mentioned this on the show, but the reason that I left the pulpit when I was a Presbyterian pastor was because I believed in Jesus, I believed in the infallibility of Scripture, but yet there'd be your opinion as Episcopalian and the Methodist opinion and the yeah. Baptist. We all had different, we all believed in this, right. the foundation of Scripture. But m my wife Marilyn and I were both pro-life in sadly a majority pro-choice denomination. And I remember thinking this question. I believed my theology was once saved, always saved. Mm -hmm. You accept Jesus, you're saved. If you died tonight, mm -hmm. you're going to heaven. I remember Billy Graham on TV saying that. I knew if I died tonight, I'd go to heaven. Okay, you know that. And I remember thinking, okay, then why not euthanasia? Then why not suicide? If you're so suffering and you're convinced that you can't be healed, yet you know I'm going to heaven because of guaranteed salvation, then what's the argument against euthanasia? What's the argument against suicide? Mm -hmm. right. And that there, Scripture alone doesn't deal with euthanasia. Mm -hmm. So unless you have a church that's not going to keep pushing the lines mm -hmm. every mm -hmm. five days, right. you right. need a tr an authority that trusts when you can't make the decision yourself. Right. Yeah. right. I think Calvin and Luther said that you couldn't even prove from Scripture uh, that it should be one man, one woman. <laughs> couldn't prove that because you see some of the saints yep. with multiple wives. So yep. really you need the teaching of the church to say, no, this is the way it's been from the beginning. This is the way it is. And to speak that, that word authoritatively. All right. Hey, we have a number of phone calls and emails. Let's take our first caller, Mary from Michigan. Hello, Mary. What's your question? Hello, Marcus. What a pleasure to talk to you. Oh, thank I you, wonder if you could please speak to this. I'm a very highly educated woman in the academic world. My dearest friends are likewise, but more and more, the secular cynicism and the indifference becomes so much of a problem that it's hard to maintain a friendship. I am like Jim, surrounded with books at all times, which I greatly enjoy, and I try to impart what I know, but it's such a cold place. 
Can you uh, speak to that? Mary, thank you for your, our prayers are with you, Mary. What's your thought? Are you well, just, just thinking about uh, the most recent teaching, which has always been the teaching of the church by John Paul II and by uh, Pope Benedict XVI, that ultimately, when you think about it, that the apostles were not declaring uh, a new doctrine, but they, they were declaring the fact that this one who that they were with, who had lived with, had risen from the dead, and that we are to encounter Jesus. We need the doctrine. We need the clear teaching so that we're clear about who he is, because mm -hmm. Jesus has become the most beautiful name on the face of the earth and the most dangerous because people insert things into his name. So I would just say the importance of the encounter with Jesus Christ, yeah. of truly embracing him, and this is something I didn't understand as a young Catholic boy growing up, that I had to reciprocate the grace and mercy of God, that Christ was hanging upon the cross. I didn't know how he got to me. I mean, he got to me in baptism without my doing anything as an infant, but that I had to, as an adult, kiss him back. This is conversion, to give yourself to him. So I would say the importance of encounter the importance of the sacraments in the Catholic Church, of, uh, of having God himself and Jesus Christ to be placed in my mouth and upon my tongue. Now that's an encounter. Mm -hmm. If you've got problems with your tongue, with speech, with cussing or cursing, uh, the sacrament, intimacy with God to cleanse and purify you. So I, I would say uh, to Mary that I hope she will increase her intimacy, intimacy with Jesus Christ who is a true groom, and that she will find people that understand this intimate encounter as well. Mary, and I want to make a comment, Mary. Uh, I've got a book I want to recommend to you. You're one that loves books. You are a reader, um, intellectual, and you're, it sounds like your problem was you're surrounded <laughs> by these cold intellectuals that okay. are not open. A book by uh, Dietrich von Hildebrand called Transformation in Christ. It's published by Ignatius Press. Uh, it's it's a, a gem of a book. Um, I'm sure it's on EWTN Religious Catalog, Transformation in Christ. And then what, what made me think about that is that he has a chapter on, I think it's called True Consciousness, but it's about in your journey to Christ, there comes a place where you have to recognize that your focus of life is on yourself or it's always on ripping things apart yeah. rather than just hearing Jesus. Yeah. And the intellectuals are particularly guilty of always analyzing you know, tearing it apart yes. rather than really just listening to God. Mm. They're either thinking about how they're going to make them more intellectual, it's going to make them more rich, it's mm -hmm. going to make them teach this, rather than hearing it. Yeah. And this is an excellent book. In fact, the producer says, religious catalog, if you want to call 1-800-854-6316, 1-800-854-6316. Uh, <laughs> Dietrich von Hildebrand's wonderful book, Transformation in Christ. We got another email, Bill in Virginia. Dear Marcus, thank you and your guests so very much for helping me confident, confidently and charitably, I hope, defend my faith. I think parishes throughout the country should have an apologetics ministry where lay people periodically meet and discuss discrete apologetic issues. Such a ministry would not in any way supplant the RCIA, but would be directed yeah. primarily mm -hmm. at parish members wishing to better explain their faith in the workplace, to spouses, at social gatherings, etc. What do you and the Pintos think? Yeah. Well, that's really true because, you know, <laughs> in Protestant land, you know, we have a Bible study and we always have some kind of discipleship group where we're dissecting the word, you know, and, and how does it apply to me and how is this going to make a difference in my life? And, and that's true. You know, one of the things that we did when mm -hmm. we first Turn became um, Catholic and we needed fellowship and we needed to be with other people is we had people come to our house and who were on the journey and talk about how they were doing and how f family members yeah. were handling that. Yeah, and we called it uh, Journey to Fullness. And so we had them into our house. We had the Catholic Study Bible, which is filled with apologetic teaching. Yep. Just went over those teachings together, had some fellowship, some prayer, singing of songs, some dessert. It's wonderful. So we need those small groups, those cells of life where lay people can get together and discuss uh, defending the faith and what our faith is all about. Yeah, I remember a great, uh, great, <coughs> great with quotes, um, Protestant theologian Karl Barth, who said, you need to have a Bible and a newspaper. You know, yes. that was how you, you know, okay, well, there's, there's good in that. Mm -hmm. But Catholics, the Bible and the catechism. Mm -hmm. yes. To make sure that the way we read the Bible, we interpret it within the context of the deposit of faith. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the way you do both Catholic mm -hmm. Bible study. Let's take a break. We'll come back in a moment with more of your questions and emails for Joy and Jim.
Welcome back to The Journey Home. My guests tonight are Jim and Joy Pinto. What's the name of that program you do on the radio? Again? At Home with Jim and Joy. Okay, I want to yes. make sure I got it right. And, uh, Every Monday, uh, 2 to 3. That's right, and I do want to remind uh, the audience that on Wednesdays I have a radio program by the, uh, the, the, the great gift of EWTN. I, uh, they, they put up with me enough on Monday night, but they do allow me to do a little bit of radio. So deep in Scripture on Wednesdays, 2 o'clock, and uh, you can uh, tune in and hear my guests and I talk about the verses we never show again. That's this Wednesday at 2 o'clock on EWTN Radio. Um, my guest this week, um, oh, what's my guest this week? Oh, well, turn to the website, EWTN, web, uh, deepinscripture.com. You can find out more about uh, uh, the name of my guest for each week. Uh, I'm trying to remember what it was, Sheila Logminus. Logminus is my guest this week. Please tune in this week. We loved. In fact, it's a call-in show. We'd love to have you give us a call about some of your questions for the radio program. Before we take another phone call or email, though, I was thinking as we were talking, uh, just quickly, because I know we have a phone call, right, that we both use the phrase, offer it up. Yeah. And I'm thinking those the people out there, they came from at least my background, having a clue. Mm. What does it mean, right. offer it up? Well, the first phrase that comes to mind for me, I think it's from St. Paul that ta he talks about filling up the cup of sufferings of, of Christ. So, I mean, what can I fill up for Christ's sake? But, but Christ, in a sense, is not here physically. He's here in the whole body of Christ. So to unite sufferings with the suffering servant, Jesus was the suffering servant of Isaiah. I think, in a sense, suffering is an intrusion. Death is an intrusion, but suffering and death are here, and they do have meaning. Uh, and so we do seek to unite our sufferings to him, to bring those to the cross, to give that to him and say, Lord, I, I'm offering this to you. I'm giving this to you. Use this in, in some way to glorify your name for, for bringing other souls to yourself or perfecting me to reflect more fully your glory and your honor. I lost my mom at age five uh, through no fault of my own, no, no fault of hers. And she died tremendous suffering in my life. But I had an aunt, my Aunt Anna in particular, lots of good women in my life that just loved me for my own sake. But my Aunt Anna would come to me, good Catholic, would make many novenas, came into my life in a special way after my mother's death. And she would always speak with me, beautiful Italian lady, you know, Jimmy boy, God loves you. He, he's allowed this suffering in your life because God's going to do great things in your life. He's going to use this suffering. You're going to know Jesus. You have a great future in front of you. John Paul II speaks about the gospel of suffering, the good news of suffering. Hey, you know, none of us really want to suffer or get yeah. cancer or whatever it might be or, or, you know, be confronted by people about our witness for Christ. But you know what? God will take every evil and turn it into good. He'll take every curse and he'll turn it into a blessing. He'll take darkness and he'll turn it into light. He'll take the death of the cross and give resurrection. And these are the spiritual principles. And so we want to unite ourselves with him that we might too have a resurrection like his, and that, that the, the cross, his suffering, is his glory. It's a place where truth bursts forth. In 1 Corinthians 12, it talks about all the gifts of the body and all the different parts of the body, the toes, the, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, the ears, we're all yeah. different parts of the body, but we're of a body. Yes. And it's the body of Christ. Right. And he talks about that has arranged the organs of the body in such a way that, you know, that, that mm -hmm. they work together. But the, the one thing that I wanted to point out is that when if mm -hmm. one member exactly. suffers, all suffer together. Yes, that's, that's profound. I mean, that's the point of redemptive suffering mm -hmm. yes. is because we are a part 
of the body of Christ. It's not Jesus out there suffering and then he's going to help me. No, mm -hmm. we are a part of the body. Mm -hmm. And we suffer as a part of the body, this redemptive connection we have for one another. But again, it's not just the, the church alive, it's the church triumphant. Mm -hmm. And so as you were saying, they're sitting on your bedside. Mm -hmm. mm. Right, and it's true. And in my own personal suffering, I mean, God came in and in my interior, he just opened up another dimension in my own spirituality. I would not have learned that had I not suffered. Yeah. My prayer when I was going through my suffering was that I would suffer well, that I would go through this and bring glory to the Lord through my suffering. At the end, I was sad, this was bizarre, but at the end of my final chemotherapy, I knew that dance of suffering with the Lord was gonna be over. And I knew it was coming to an end and there was actually like a, a grief in my heart that where I have been with God, I'm never gonna be again. And so I, I, it was like, delight in your suffering. I delighted in my suffering. I mean, that's crazy in our thinking, but that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to count it all joy, you know? Yeah, and you really, that's scripture that says, he who finds himself loses himself, and he who loses himself finds himself. And the opportunity to lose yourself is when suffering comes, when you have to face death, the death of a loved one, and to, to look that right in the eye and to glimpse the divine victory of God and say, I, I choose to lose my life that I might find my life. I'm not afraid, and you're free. Right. And you know about the Catholic Church, I lost my mother this Mother's Day. Um, and what, a couple of days before she died, she said to me, when I die, she said, the next day, the sun's going to come up. You might not like it that the sun's coming up. She said, but you better get on with the living. Amen. That's right. And that is so true because, you know, we suffer, and my mother suffered, and but she suffered, and we had to deal with end-of-life issues with her. Um, that was scary, um, and, you know, we went through that whole process, but she suffered, and in her suffering, we were with her at her bedside, and it was, it was a triumphant victory. She had like a speed reading course on spirituality through her suffering near her death. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Like, God gave her so much, and, and, and this euthanasia is so demonic to cut people off from that oh. suffering, from that purification, from coming face to face with the Lord, from understanding your own humanity, and in the midst of all your suffering to say, I choose you, I choose to worship you. It's so demonic to try and euthanize, so-called euthanize people. So we, we kill people at the beginning of life through abortion, and then at the end of life, we don't allow them to go through that suffering that purifies them, they bless their family yeah. members, they instruct That's their family powerful. members, they're yeah. so close to that next life. They may be encountering other people on the other side. Powerful, powerful stuff. And, and the, with all of that, the part of the point I wanted to make sure we make is that the Bible alone won't get you there. Right. You're not going to figure that out, just the Bible alone. Because mm -hmm. yeah. how many Protestant groups out there, they love Jesus, they love Scripture, but they have uh, infinite understandings of the suffering mm -hmm. right. and what to deal with it. Right. You know, we need a church that's been guided by the Holy Spirit uh, and has the wisdom of the ages uh, to make sure we... We, you know, we, we hold on to things when they're, mm -hmm. even when they're tough. Mm -hmm. Let's take our next caller, Mary from Kentucky. Hello, what's your question for us tonight? I just wanted to let you all know, thank you for taking my call. And I, I am, you've been my lifeline for a lot, of, a lot of years now, but I'm coming into the church. I'm 73 years old oh, and I agree goodness. with what uh, uh, the Pintos were saying about the Lord picking us from here and there. <laughs> and bringing us in, I feel like I was born for such a time as this. Mm -hmm. And I, I, my gifting, I have my giftings, and <laughs> and my calling on my life is prayer. And uh, when I got hold of the rosary, I felt like I'd gotten hold of a light source. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm I'm just delighted to be coming into the Catholic Church. I feel like I've really come home. Mary, what a wonderful call. Thank you. And our, welcome home. Mm -hmm. Welcome home. And uh, oh, I mean, the, best, the best is yet to come. Levels of, of intimacy. And uh, it's never too late to come home. And your groom has such beautiful things in store for you. Uh, it's it's uh, joy unspeakable. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the wonderful things that God has in store for those who love him and who come home who love his church. God bless you. All right, thank you. I think we might have an email ready 
here. Let's see. I'm uh, there. We go. This comes from uh, Scott from Granville, Ohio. I wonder who this might be. I just might happen to know who this guy might be. <laughs> Joy, Jim, and Marcus. Uh, when literally thousands of people of all ages, race, and different parts of the country take part in the annual March for Life, why do you think the national media, other than EWTN, choose to ignore this event? If this many people march in Washington, D.C. for any other cause, I think the media would certainly cover it. So why this discrimination for those asking for the sanctity of life? Well, it is. It's a, they, it's, they don't want to hear it. They don't want to see it. They want it to go away. You know, and we've battled with it on the local level, um, on a national level. It, it's just, it's a blackout. Um, even in our local paper here, we had a march. We had all 2,000 people. They put a little picture. They didn't even send a reporter. I mean, it, they just want to black it out. But what we have to do is we have to respond, and we have to let them know this happened. You weren't there. Why weren't you there? And then if there are other networks that are carrying it, support the other networks that are carrying it. But tell them. Let your voice be heard. This is, this is like a family secret in the house of incest. And this nation, it, it's, it, they want to keep it a secret. There's so many, 50 million abortions, surgical that we know of, who knows how, how many. So many people are involved. So many of us have been involved in a variety of ways. And everybody's like, we do not want to speak about this. This is out there. We don't want to show the pictures. We don't want people to know about it. This just shows you the serious, absolutely serious nature of this. This is really the shedding of innocent blood. It's absolutely horrific. And to have to own, to have to come to terms with the fact that I've done this, or we're involved with this, or you know, is it, just uh, very, very difficult. We really need awakening in this nation. We need revival and renewal in the church. People do not want to see this. You know, I once got on a plane. I'll just make it real quick. But I sat down uh, on this plane. I never flew first class in my life. But they moved me up to first class. I was doing a pro-life thing, and I sat right next to an abortionist. Uh, Whoa. Yeah, and he was from my town. But Did he's he have a badge saying I am an abortionist? No, he knew me and I knew him. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and so he knew me immediately. And he, he just, you know, he had been drinking. He was loud. And I said his name. I said, Tommy Tucker. You know, I said, you know, like that. And he said to the stewardess, you know, tell this man to shut up. He's aggravating me, something like that. And so we started going at it a little bit. You know, he knew I was pro-life. He was an abortionist. I had my collar on at the time. And I said, you know, this guy's an abortionist and I'm a priest. He doesn't like what I do. I don't like what he does. And uh, we went at it for a pretty good part of the flight. And finally, I softened up a little bit. And at the end of the flight, I said, you know, I've never flown first class in my life. I've flown first class to be right next to you, that you would repent. I'll talk to you anytime, any place, anywhere. I love you, I said to him, right? At the end of the flight, the guy, another first class guy, got right in between me and, me and the abortionist. And this guy got in my face and put his finger in my face. This is in response to why isn't the media showing this. And he got in my face and he said, you ruined my flight. And that's why the media doesn't show it. That's why family members don't want to hear about it. You're ruining our lives. We could do this in secret. Nobody needs to know about it. This is the silent holocaust. Why do you have to bring this up? because we are the voice of the voiceless. We are the defenders of the helpless, yeah. because Jesus is mysteriously yoked with these little babies, and because you need hope, help, and healing. Right. They don't want to deal with it. Yeah. 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 Let's see. Uh, uh, phone call, Danny in London. Hello, Danny. Hello. Hi there, folks. Hello. Hello. Yeah. What's your question for us, Danny? Well, I'm calling from London. I'm yes. looking at the Tower Bridge and a photograph here. Um, I'm <laughs> going to Westminster Cathedral at the moment, and I have a question for Joy and Jim Pinto. Um, Joy, um, well, for Joy, um, I've been to, I came to Benny Hinn's crusade in London. He wasn't able to come there because of visa problems, but because um, um, I've had Pentecostal background, I've had uh, you know Catholic background, Protestant, and God's been doing incredible things in my life, you know, and I've met some famous people in London, like St. Sir Alex Ferguson. My question to you is, um, with your journey to the Catholic uh, mm. Church, has your intimacy with God mm. increased? Because I, I know mine mm. has, um, you know, praying the rosary and, you know, focusing on the saints and, and the Pope. Yes, um, especially at Eucharist, um, because the encounter with the King um, is like it's never been in Protestant land. And so um, usually when I receive the Eucharist, it's such an intimate moment for me. Um, I go back to the pew and I usually weep because I cannot believe 
that Jesus would come inside of me and live and empower me and change me and transform me. And so I have this encounter that I've never had before. Um, the power of the sacraments of confession in the, in the Catholic Church when, when I do wrong and um, I need to go and confess my sins and, and to have a priest absolve my sin. I mean, the intimacy, I'm, I'm, I'm healed, I'm restored, I'm delivered. Um, and just that encounter, those, those two sacraments alone, and our marriage has gotten better. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm madly in love with Jim. We had a great marriage before. Being Catholic has made him a better husband. I think being Catholic's made him a better wife. I did not tell her to wife. say that. It's unbelievable. It's great. <laughs> no, it's really true. I mean, it's really true. It's, it's a sacrament. We got it. We had our marriage blessed, you know, and so and so that's been wonderful. So yes, the yeah. intimacy, it's deeper yes. and it's greater. And we've not lost a thing. You know, we're evangelical. We're charismatic. We're Pentecostal. We're re because that's what Catholic is. Yeah. It's all of those parts. They're part of the whole. It's not one thing. It's all of those things together, and it's just increased by, by willingly, joyfully submitting ourselves to uh, the Roman Catholic Church and to the teachings of the Holy Father. It's just been absolutely wonderful. It is amazing how much it will improve a marriage because it really did straighten oh, him out. It, it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's take our email. You're from Maria. Hello, I wanted to know if Joy had any difficulty accepting Mother Mary and what role she plays in your life as a Catholic now. Well, um, at first I did, and but as a Protestant, I went to, um, I went to uh, a Catholic priest one time because I was having a difficult time in my family with one of my children, and I was uh, enduring in love as a mother. And, um, and I was praying one morning in my quiet time, and I heard this voice speak to me and say, um, my mother can help you. Now, I was Protestant when I heard this. And so I didn't know what to do with that. And so um, when Jim woke up this morning, I said, hey, hon, I had this really great, great quiet time with the Lord. And, and he, he said, his mother can help me. And, and so what do I do with that? And so I went to a Catholic mm -hmm. priest. And, and um, that day, I went to a Catholic priest and, and shared with him about this encounter that I had and what was I supposed to do with Mary because I was Protestant and you know I really didn't know Mary and I didn't really need to know Mary um, I knew she was God's mother and that was okay because as a Protestant you really don't know it. but Mary is so great because she's such a great 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 mother she can take being misunderstood like a good mother can and um, so I went to the Catholic priest and he told me that I could see Mary as a prayer partner in heaven because I, as an Episcopalian, I believed in the communion of saints. And so I began this journey as a Protestant with Mary, and I would ask her to pray for me um, because she was alive. And she knew Jesus, and she did a great job with that boy. And I was a mother in need, and I needed prayer, and I needed help from her too. And you see, that was encounter as well. See, that's very evangelical, very personal relationship. It wasn't only doctrinal, who is Mary, her distinction from the Holy Trinity and her humanity. Uh, yeah, it, it really became, take her as a prayer partner. Hmm. And so, just like we encounter Jesus and we fall in love with Jesus, you can be a Christian, but then, you know, as the evangelicals say, you know, I was converted, I, I love him. It's the same thing with Mary, that, that you can have an intimate relationship with Mary and with those, with the communion of saints. I mean, life doesn't end, it goes on, it's perfected. And that's a beautiful thing about the Catholic faith and the way you came was really through a personal relationship with Mary, taking her as your prayer partner, mm -hmm. as you're an intercessor. Yeah. All right, we have a, a caller. This is Gabrielle in Alabama. Hello, Gabrielle, what's your question? Um, my question is, as a young Catholic, how can I be more intimate with Christ as I practice my Catholic faith? Gabrielle, eight years old, thank you so much for your call. Well, as a young Catholic, um, I know probably you've made your first communion, and that's important, so you want to always prepare yourself in receiving Jesus. And as a Catholic, as an eight-year-old, you get to confess your sins. Mm -hmm. And so you want to journey that way and um, obey your parents. That's important <laughs> and because um, they're there to guide you in, in the rule of living. And, um, and so those are some good things to do. And I would say to you, Gabrielle, that the Bible and the church teaches that before you were formed in the womb, God says that he knew you. And before you were born, he consecrated you, he set you apart. Even while you were in your mother's womb, that God saw you being formed and shaped there. 
that God has loved you with an infinite love. And so the key is to always know that he loves you simply because of who you are, because you are his child, you are his daughter, you are his bride. So that's the teaching of the church and the teaching of the Bible. And so it's very important for you always to know God's divine affirming love for you. I was thinking that before we run out of time, let's, let's talk about your prayer card that you want to make yeah. sure mention to the audience. Yeah. Uh, we have a prayer here, it's called the Face Prayer, and it says so much about our conversion. Joy and I pray this prayer every day. We're inviting people all over the country to pray the Face Prayer and live the Face lifestyle. Maybe we could just pray it and I could say a word about it. Heavenly Father, I, I embrace, embrace your, your grace this day, day so that, that I, I might not, not think of another, another speak to another, or, or touch, touch another, another without, without first looking, looking for your face in the other. other. I ask, I ask all, all this through Jesus Christ, Christ God incarnate, God, God with skin, God, God made poor, God with a face. face. Amen. So the idea here, I mean, the prayer is not to think about another person, speak to another person, touch another person without looking for the face of Jesus Christ mm. in that person. Because Jesus is God with skin, God made poor, God with a face. Amen. If we would do this, the mediation of Christ, practice that mediation that is always there, in our lives, in our marriages, in our families, with our friends, with our enemies. This is a pro-life, pro-marriage and family lifestyle. And so they can go to jimandjoypinto.com. We can send them a couple of prayer cards. We'd like to invite people to pray with us that prayer and to live that lifestyle. It's real important. Um, I'm a, the executive director of a crisis pregnancy center here in Birmingham. and. We use that with our clients because 98% of our girls who are coming in who are in unplanned pregnancies are African American and one of the things that I tell them is that they are good and the baby mm -hmm. inside of them is good and what what's going on here is and we you know we're trying to rescue this baby and save this woman from being destroyed from making a bad choice so we affirm constantly the essence of her human being because she's feeling the worst about herself already the last thing yeah. she needs is condemnation and judgment she needs to be fortified and loved and deeply affirmed and again this is what i was saying to, to gabby is that god's divine affirming love is primarily about our being we need to do right but God doesn't love us because we do right. Even if that girl had had an abortion, we do post-abortion healing work, we want to say to her, you're good. What you've done is not good. John Paul II says it's not good. It's a horrendous thing. But have hope because you will become, if you seek forgiveness and know the Lord, some of the most eloquent spokespersons on behalf of life. And this is what this prayer is about, the mystical presence of Jesus Christ with every human being and affirming that in the other person. Uh, First of all, how, if they want to get a copy <laughs> of the prayer, how do they get it again? They go to jimandjoypinto.com. Go to our website. Just sign up and we'll send you for free uh, right. the prayer card. Maybe in the last minute or so, how does praying that, could praying that prayer help bring uh, renewal to a marriage? Well, mm. one thing is that for us, uh. you can't uh, have an attitude with the man that you're trying to encounter the face of God with. Mm. And you see him through God's eyes. And then I'm hoping and praying that he's looking back at me and seeing the reflection of Jesus back at me. Amen. And it causes our love to go deeper. And it, and it just dispels selfishness. Joy, Joy and I dated for five years. We didn't live this prayer. That one year we courted and since that time, I understand that she is married to Christ. That I will have to present her to Christ. That he will know my faith by the way she looks. You know, spiritually. And so the deal is, I have no right, I don't own her. I have no right to think about her, speak to her, or touch her, except through Jesus Christ and his mediation. I have to reverence that relationship and all relationships. This transforms your life. I was thinking that that prayer forms a foundation for a couple to live out Ephesians chapter five, mm. where it's talking about the mutual submission of a husband and a wife and the headship and all of that, which is there. Mm -hmm. But unless you're seeing Christ in the other person, you can't live out what you're called to do by St. Paul in Ephesians five. Right. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go look at Ephesians five. It's, you always hear it at weddings, mm -hmm. yeah. but then you don't hear it after weddings because right. nobody wants to listen mm -hmm. to it. Right. It talks about a husband being sacrificial for his wife and right. a wife. You know, mm -hmm. you, but that allows you to do that. Mm -hmm. right. Thank you both. Thank you. It's for a your privilege. Witness, mm -hmm. For what you're doing at EWTN Radio, for your work with Priest for Life, Crisis Pregnancy Center. 
It's uh, busy. I was going to say, you're both busy <laughs> folks. <laughs> it's good yeah. busy. <laughs> it's good stuff. Uh, let's uh, pray that prayer again as we close, real quickly. Heavenly Father, I embrace, embrace your grace this day so that, that I, I might not think, think of another, another speak, speak to another, or touch another, touch another without, without first looking for your face in the other. I ask all this through Jesus Christ, God incarnate, God with skin, God made poor, God with a face. Amen. All right. Amen. Thank you both. Thank you. God bless you both. Bless you. Good to be with you. Thank you for joining us on this episode of The Journey Home. I pray that this has been an encouragement to you. Look for Jesus in the face of others. God bless you. Thank you.